I have a confession to make. I am a convicted felon. I once went to the movies and I saw fire on screen and in my excitement, I yelled out fire. And the theater was crowded. I knew it was wrong. I knew I had no First Amendment right to say it. The police immediately came and arrested me under California's Anti-Fire in a Crowded Theater Statement Act of 1989. I spent 10,000 years in jail, but when I got out of jail, I was inspired to become the lawyer that I am today, to make sure that no one would ever commit the same First Amendment speech violations that I did in my younger days. Now, obviously, all of that is complete nonsense. But if you spent any time online, you might not know that. If I took a quick poll and asked you, what are you absolutely 100% not allowed to yell in a movie theater? Well, everybody knows the answer to that question. And almost everyone is wrong about that particular question. But don't worry, even the people in government, perhaps especially the people in government who should know better, do not know better. Let's check in with New York Governor Kathy Hochul. Yeah, I'll stand, I'll protect the First Amendment any day of the week but you don't protect hate speech. You don't protect incendiary speech. You're not allowed to scream fire in a crowded theater. There are limitations on speech. Unfortunately, we are now all dumber for having watched that clip. The only thing that we've learned is that the governor of New York does not understand free speech at all. But luckily, I am fired up to explain how everyone keeps getting the First Amendment wrong. So let's get this party started. Now, obviously everyone on the internet thinks you simply cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, I am here to tell you that yes, you can generally yell fire in a crowded theater. Generally speaking, it's legal. Say it with me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Now this First Amendment myth has a long history that simply will not die. And the origin of it comes from an opinion from none other than one of the most esteemed jurists in history, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He wrote, quote, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. And millions of Americans Americans across the decades have decided that this means you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Justice Holmes never qualified that the theater had to be crowded. He simply said that shouting fire when there was no fire and causing a panic was not protected speech. So why did Holmes bother to say this? Were Americans in the early 1900s constantly pulling hilarious pranks in which they falsely claimed the theaters were on fire? Uh, no, not really, but deadly theater fires were common in that particular time. It was standard practice that due to lax regulation, when all of the seats in the theater were sold out, the owners would seat people in the aisles and stairways. Sets and props used to be made of extremely flammable materials. There wasn't much ventilation and theaters rarely marked exit doors. In 1903, at least 602 people died in a fire in Chicago's Iroquois Theater, which only had one entrance. Chicago building codes required separate staircases for every balcony, but the architects who designed the Iroquois ignored the rules. And instead, the theater just had one staircase so that everyone could see and be seen regardless of social class. And when the fire broke out, the building was completely full. Aisles and stairways were full of theater goers. They ran over each other trying to get through the front doors. And the Iroquois theater fire was not a unique event. There were so many deadly theater fires that people genuinely were afraid of crowded spaces. So all of this formed the background for when Justice Holmes wrote his famous opinion in the 1919 case of Schenck versus the United States. Now you might be surprised, but the facts of the Schenck case bear no resemblance to a crowded theater full of fire phobic patrons. Now, Charles Schenck was a socialist who attempted to distribute thousands of leaflets encouraging people to evade the World War I draft. The government charged him with violating the Espionage Act by conspiring to cause insubordination in the military and Navy. The Supreme Court upheld Schenck's conviction and the constitutionality of the Espionage Act, finding that Congress could regulate speech that created, quote, a clear and present danger. Now, all Schenck did was send leaflets to recently conscripted soldiers suggesting that the draft was a form of involuntary servitude in violation of the 13th Amendment. And Justice Holmes wrote that the widespread dissemination of the leaflets was sufficiently likely to disrupt the conscription process. 
That was what gave rise to his so-called clear and present danger. Justice Holmes conceded that the letter may have been constitutionally protected in many places in ordinary times, but determined that the character of the writing, quote, depends upon the circumstances which it is done. Therefore, Holmes held, quote, the question in every case is whether the words used are used in such a circumstance and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. And in so doing, he compared the leaflets to falsely shouting fire in a theater provoking a panic, the type of speech that he thought could be regulated. Now, the clear and present danger test was favorable to the government, particularly during wartime, when the court gave the government wide leeway to restrict speech. But Justice Holmes realized his analysis in Schenck wasn't very good and was rife for abuse and changed his mind within a year. In the case of Abrams versus the United States, another case involving anti-war activists, the Supreme Court upheld convictions of Russian immigrants who were charged with violating the Sedition Act. This time, though, Holmes dissented from the majority. He advocated for a much more rigorous test, arguing that the government government should only be able to punish speech if there was an imminent danger that it will bring about the substantive evils. But Schenck's clear and present danger test was eventually overruled 50 years later when the court replaced it with the imminent lawless action test, which protects a broad range of speech. Though you might remember it from the Brandenburg incitement test, which um, let's just say it's very relevant these days. So Holmes's analogy was not only imperfect, but it was dicta in the very case that created it, meaning it never had any force of law, and it was based out of a case that is simply no longer good law at all. And the problem with the fire in a crowded theater analogy, generally speaking, is that people think it stands for the proposition that you can regulate almost any bad speech, but it was a terrible analogy from uh, the, the very inception, and it was used to regulate speech that was clearly protected. So pop quiz, when could you yell fire in a crowded theater? Well, first of all, if there was an actual fire, uh, you would be warning other people, so you're well within your rights to yell fire when there is a fire in a theater. Probably when you mistakenly, but in good faith, think that there is a fire, even if there isn't one, even if it was false, but you thought that there was a fire, again, you'd be warning people to try to get to safety. Maybe if you needed to get someone's attention quickly, like an active shooter situation, where you need to concisely convey that people need to get out of there very quickly. Uh, maybe when you were telling a joke, if you're a comedian and it's a punchline to a joke, you can probably yell fire in a crowded theater. If the movie you're watching has fire in the title or fire on screen, or a script calls for an actor to yell fire, I mean, the number of situations where you could actually yell fire in a crowded theater probably drown out situations where you could not yell fire in a crowded theater. That magical phrase is judged by the exact same First Amendment standards that we use to judge every other kind of speech. So the question is, did you intend to cause panic in circumstances likely to cause a panic and injury? Uh, well, if not, then you're probably in the clear. But that takes us to the second most pervasive free speech myth, which is that hate speech is not free speech. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that it absolutely is. The woman was too stunned to speak. Things that are hateful understandably make people uncomfortable, which is why even good actors like Lou Diamond Phillips have bad takes like this. Let's all please remember that hate speech is not free speech. It comes with a cost to real lives. Let's make kindness our default setting, which is a nice sentiment, but it's also extremely wrong. Hate speech is free speech, according to the Supreme Court. Oh, wait a minute, I'm getting a breaking news alert. Uh, according to the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court has stated that hate speech is not protected speech. Uh, well, I'm sorry, random Twitter guy, but the Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled that the First Amendment protects even repugnant and hateful expressions. For example, the court ruled that the Westboro Baptist Church could protest at the funerals of dead soldiers carrying signs that say, thank God for dead soldiers, and that have homophobic slurs. Similarly, the court struck down a St. Paul ordinance that made it a crime to place a burning cross or swastika anywhere, quote, in an attempt to arouse anger or alarm on the basis of race, color, creed, or religion. The court also ruled that Nazis could march through the streets of Skokie, Illinois, a town where many Holocaust survivors lived. In other words, hate speech, as a part of free speech, is settled law that won't be overturned anytime soon. But if the concept of the First Amendment having no protections for hate speech isn't really a thing in American law, then why do so many people think that hate speech is illegal? Well, they might be looking at how European countries regulate speech. Those other countries generally don't have the same kind of First Amendment protections. And after the horrors of World War II, many European nations passed laws criminalizing speech that incites hatred or advocates genocide against certain groups. 
This is certainly a point of controversy in the United States, where many, many people wish that First Amendment protections did not attach to what they consider to be hate speech. And you might not like it, but in America, the solution to hate speech has traditionally been, in the words of Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, quote, more speech, not enforced silence. And this might not please everyone, but it's certainly an easier principle to apply than an outright ban on hate speech. Why? Well, because it's really hard to define what constitutes hate speech. Certainly, President Ron DeSantis would define hate speech differently than President Elizabeth Warren. But at least for the time being, if you believe that the government should be able to regulate hate speech, I'm allowed to call you a stupid idiot. That takes us to the third myth, which involves the application of the First Amendment to private corporations. The free speech clause of the First Amendment prohibits, quote, the government from abridging the freedom of speech. It does not stop private people or private corporations from censoring speech. And by that same token, whenever people are complaining about Section 230 and the internet and protecting big corporations, almost 100% of the time, the thing that they are upset about is not Section 230, but rather the First Amendment itself. So for example, if you call up a radio show and the host cuts you off and hangs up on you, your rights were not violated. You can't force the radio show to give you a platform. Similarly, if you post misinformation on Twitter and the company decides that your tweet violates their rules, they can ban your account. You can't force Twitter to give you a platform, despite how hard you are trying. Or if you post a comment on someone's food blog saying that no one should ever put pineapple on pizza, they have a right to delete your comment, even though it is absolutely correct. But again, you can't force someone else to promote your speech. And the best way to think about this dichotomy is by considering public versus private schools. Public schools are an arm of the government. The Supreme Court has said that public school students, quote, do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech and expression at the schoolhouse gate. Students have a limited right to wear expressive clothing and hand out petitions as long as they don't disrupt the functioning of school. But private schools, on the other hand, uh, do not give students those same rights because a private school isn't a state entity. Cranbrook, that's a private school. <laughs> Many people believe this is very unfair, but in America, the First Amendment protects your expression from intrusion from the government, not from private corporations. When you're talking about private corporations, you always have the option to take your ball and go home, to leave a popular platform, and then create a platform where no one actually goes there. But at least you can express yourself. And while most people probably understand this, surely it must be the case that you cannot display profanity in public with abandon. Like this particular Twitter take, if you know someone who is displaying a flag or sign with profanity, you need to report it. It is against the law to have public profanity in the open, even on private property. Report them and have the police have it removed. If they refuse, file a lawsuit. Now this particular bad legal take involves at least two common myths. One, you can't display profanity, and two, you can't desecrate the flag. Well, in a 1971 case, again involving the draft, the Supreme Court established that the government cannot criminalize the display of profane words in public places. In the case of Cohen versus California, Paul Cohen wore a jacket with the words, fuck the draft, into an LA courthouse. Police arrested him for disturbing the peace. Cohen was convicted and sentenced to 30 days in jail. An appeals court affirmed the conviction because it was foreseeable that wearing the jacket could cause a violent reaction. As you can see, in every era, the US government was really sensitive about people expressing their desire to avoid the draft. But a closely divided 5-4 Supreme Court reversed the conviction. Justice John Harlan, leading the majority, held that the phrase, fuck the draft, wasn't an obscenity, nor was it fighting words. It couldn't be an obscenity because the statement wasn't erotic, and it couldn't be fighting words because it was just a general statement, not one directed at inciting imminent lawless action. California argued that public profanity invaded the interests of unwilling viewers, especially women and children. Uh, Justice Harlan memorably observed though that people who were offended by the jacket, quote, could effectively avoid further bombardment of their sensibilities by averting their eyes. And although some people hate profanity, quote, one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. Justice Harlan also wrote, quote, the constitution leaves matters of taste and style so largely to the individual. In other words, there's no legal reason you can't just come out and say, Joe Biden rather than let's go Brandon, you cowards. And at the same time, if you wanted to, you could desecrate the flag. Flag desecration includes everything from burning the American flag to putting it on a beer bottle. 
Congress has tried to ban flag desecration for decades, but the Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled that you have a First Amendment right to hurt the flag. Though in the early 20th century, the Supreme Court did uphold a number of flag desecration statutes. But by the 1960s, the court had reversed course. For example, when civil rights leader James Meredith was shot in Mississippi in 1966, Sidney Street took his own flag into the street in New York City and lit it on fire. Street, a black veteran of World War II, said, quote, if they can do this to James Meredith, we don't need a flag. The city fined Street $100. Street filed a lawsuit and eventually it reached the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court reversed Street's conviction. It held that uh, Street could not be punished for burning the flag. Then in 1974, the court reversed the conviction of a college student who put a peace sign on the flag. The state prosecuted the student under a law that made it illegal to improperly use the flag. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that this was symbolic speech that was protected by the First Amendment. And when the court reversed a flag burning conviction in 1989, the Senate and President George H.W. Bush were outraged and Congress enacted the Flag Protection Act. Protesters responded by immediately burning flags and they were convicted under federal law. But the Supreme Court struck that law down in the United States versus Eichmann, holding that, quote, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea it's self-offensive or disagreeable. Though if you go out there and exercise your right to truthfully yell fire in a crowded theater or burn a bunch of flags in the street, you'll probably build up quite the appetite. And today's sponsor, Factor 75, can help with that. Because Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And the meals are completely ready to eat. Eliminate hours it would take to shop, meal prep, and cook so you can spend your time doing things that you actually want to do. Because Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes. In the same amount of time that I could think about going to the grocery grocery store, my Factor meal is already done and it's surprisingly affordable. Factor's team of gourmet chefs creates each meal using only ingredients with integrity to make you feel your best, and they really are extremely delicious. Factor supports wholesome eating made simple. Their menus are updated weekly with 34 different options. Choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. Factor takes the guesswork out of grocery shopping and meal prep, saving you time and energy for other things. Factor's no hassle prepared food to make sure that you always have something nutritious on hand when you don't have time to think about making a meal. And sometimes I just want a good good, healthy meal without having to cook. So give Factor a try by going to factor75.com and use the code LegalEagle50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Or just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and use the code LegalEagle50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle or I'll see you in court.